Welcome. Good morning to some, uh, good afternoon to others. My name is Steve London. I'm a corporate lawyer in Boston. I'm a national co-chair of Jewish National Fund USA Lawyers for Israel. Jewish National Fund USA, like the people of Israel, remains resolute in response to Iran's ongoing failed attempts to erase the only Jewish state in the world. We were there in 1901 when Theodore Herzl re-energized the Zionist movement. We were there in 1948 when David Ben-Gurion declared the establishment of the state of Israel. And you better believe me, we are here in 2024, stronger and more determined than ever to build and support our land of Israel for the Jewish people everywhere. We'd like to welcome the Honorable Roy Altman and Professor Eugene Konovorich, um, as well as all of the attorneys across the United States who have joined us for our CLE program today. On behalf of Jewish National Fund Lawyers for Israel, I want to express our appreciation to each of you in our community for your continued support and commitment to the land and people of Israel. This November 14th through the 17th, please join us for the Jewish National Fund USA Global Conference for Israel in Dallas. It's critical that we stand together in support of Israel, so please join us. Details may be found at jnf.org backslash nc. As a member benefit of Lawyers for Israel, JNF has an online national attorney referral directory in which you can upload your firm's practice areas and contact information. This is a wonderful resource for referrals. The directory also allows you to connect with like-minded pro-Israel attorneys throughout the country. I know from personal experience, this enabled me to connect with attorneys out of state to refer work to and receive referrals from other firms. You'll receive the link through email following the program. Being added to the directory is one of the perks of joining our Lawyers for Israel Society. Hello, my name is Ellen Lawson and I'm an attorney in Scottsdale, Arizona. When disaster strikes, two things are needed, trust and bringing people back home. Jewish National Fund USA has been on the ground working in Southern and Northern Israel for 20 years. We are true partners, we have their trust. Now we are working to bring evacuated residents back home. Together with area residents at the helm and with the help of thousands of volunteers like you who are going on JNF missions and joined by Israelis, we will create a secure, beautiful haven for all the residents to return home to. I'd like to now turn the program over to Maya Aaron, partner at Mark Migdal and Hayden in Miami. Today's presentation will be based upon how Hamas hacked the international law of war. During the presentation, if you have questions, please type them into the Q&A section that can be found at the bottom of your screen. It is my pleasure to introduce our keynote speakers today. The Honorable Roy Altman serves as a judge of the United States District Court for the Southern District of Florida. He began his legal career as a law clerk to Judge Stanley Marcus of the United States Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit, and then was an assistant United States attorney for the Southern District of Florida for six years, where he prosecuted hundreds of criminal cases and tried more than 20 cases to jury verdict. Before becoming a judge, he was a partner at the law firm of Potters Orsek, where he specialized in aviation law and commercial litigation. 
Professor Eugene Kantorovich serves as director of George Mason's Scalia Law School's Center for the Middle East and International Law, and is one of the world's preeminent experts on universal jurisdiction and maritime piracy, as well as international law and the Israeli-Arab conflict. He was previously a professor of law at the Northwestern University Pritzker School of Law. Professor Kantorovich has published over 30 major scholarly articles and book chapters in leading law reviews and peer-reviewed journals in the United States and Europe, including the American Journal of International Law, International Review of Law and Economics, and Stanford Law Review. His scholarship has been cited by appellate courts in the U.S. and around the world. Thank you, Maya. Um, again, we're very, very pleased and honored to have uh, Judge Altman and Professor Kantorovich with us today. Um, if we could start off, Judge, with you. Um, I, I know that you recently visited Israel with a group of 14 federal judges for about a week. What did you learn about this issue of proportionality of Israel's military response in Gaza? And how has that proportionality affected the IDF's actions in Gaza? Well, thank you, Steve. Thanks for having me. And it's uh, it's nice to be with all of you. Um, and in particular with Professor Kantorovich, who's a friend and um, and who we saw and actually heard, had a lecture from we, the judges, while we were in Israel on the question of the laws of war and uh, in particular, uh, the rules of engagement and proportionality. Um, so one of the things uh, we did was we, we heard from Professor Kantorovich about uh, precisely this question, how Hamas has hijacked the laws of war, and, and uh, I'll leave it to him to discuss that issue specifically. I'll, I'll just mention uh, one thing about it later, which is that much of how we treat Hamas and allow Hamas to kind of deploy a sort of cheat code on the laws of war um, is analogous to a situation that, that we lawyers and judges deal with here domestically in the United States, and I'll touch on that a little bit later. Uh, but uh, the main uh, meetings that we had on this issue of the laws of war, uh, as it pertains in particular to the conflict in Gaza, uh, were meetings that we had with the MAG. In, in the U.S., we call the top lawyers in the military the JAGs. Uh, in Israel, they call them MAGs, the Military Advocate General. Um, and, and we had a meeting with the MAG and, and some of the MAG's uh, deputy lawyers. And um, the meeting was, for lack of a better word, uh, eye-opening. Uh, it was extremely informative and uh, I think was transformative for many of the judges, including me, who uh, thought we knew something about uh, the laws of war uh, as it pertains to that conflict, but really, um, really didn't know exactly what was going on in the ground. And here's what I mean. In Israel, uh, there are MAG lawyers, military lawyers, who are deployed with almost every commander um, in order to ensure both that the commander and his chain of command are following the laws uh, of war and international law, but also to continually give advice as uh, operations and strikes are happening. Uh, a little known fact is that lawyers are reviewing and authorizing almost every strike that happens in Gaza before it occurs. Now, some strikes have to happen very reactively. Uh, if you live in the Gaza envelope, there are less than 15 seconds to get out of the way of an incoming Hamas rocket. It can be up to a minute and a half uh, if you live in Tel Aviv or Jerusalem. So sometimes things are happening very dynamically and a lawyer doesn't have time to get involved. But that's why the lawyers are out there deployed with the commanders, because they're not only uh, reviewing the strikes that are taking place, they're also giving advice. And the second thing I wanted to mention is that that advice is very different than the advice that is given by JAGs to military commanders in, for example, the United States or in any other Western co country around the world. In the United States, a JAG officer will give advice, but the commander is ultimately responsible and makes the call. In Israel, the advice is not precatory. It's not aspirational. 
the commander is not free, generally speaking, to disregard the MAG's advice on a particular uh, strike or target. And the third thing I wanted to mention about uh, the meeting that we had with the MAGs is that the MAGs showed us over and over again images and, in particular, videotapes, video recordings of IDF drones and IDF planes locked onto Hamas military targets in Gaza. It could be guys with RPGs or rifles. It could be uh, folks firing out of a building or out of an ambulance or out of a hospital, or in one case, we saw rockets being fired by Hamas out of a Boy Scouts uh, training room. Uh, whatever it is, there is a military target, unquestionably a legitimate military target under international law. And the drone, the Israeli drone or the fighter jet is over the target and gets locked onto the target. And he says to his commander, or she says to the commander, I'm locked onto the target, I'm ready to fire. And then something incredible happens, something we never see in Western media outlets. The lawyer or the lawyer through the commander will come over the radio and say, hey, what's that up on the right top of the screen? And the drone pilot will say, will look up there and say, that is two kids playing soccer 30 meters away. Strike canceled. And then the drone pilot will say, Kibalti received, strike canceled. Or uh, that's uh, civilians walking 50 meters away. Or there's uh, people shopping for food 100 meters away. Strike canceled, strike canceled, strike canceled. Over and over again, the Israeli military is canceling appropriate strikes on legitimate military targets in order to avoid the possibility of civilian casualties in Gaza, something no other army in the world does in real time, the way the Israeli military is doing it in Gaza. And you don't just have to believe the MAG lawyers or the videos that we saw or me about it. You can see what Richard Kemp or John Spencer, non-Jews, not Israeli, some of the preeminent scholars on the law of war are saying uh, in their Newsweek articles, in the Wall Street Journal, uh, on the Urban Warfare Project podcast that John Spencer runs out of West Point. Um, this may be, John Spencer said, the most humane military effort in an urban context that the world has ever seen. And he has given uh, numbers to prove it. Um, it in uh, John Spencer's view, uh, what has uh, been deemed acceptable under international law in uh, previous urban warfare contexts is a kill ratio of about one to nine, one militant to about nine uh, civilians. And, um, and that's been true uh, for decades. In Iraq and Afghanistan, we, the United States and our allies, set a new gold standard uh, for a militant to civilian kill ratio. Our, our kill ratio was about one to five, one to four and a half at our best. And many people believe that was just a standard that no army would ever be able to meet uh, ever again. Uh, but in much more difficult, arguably difficult, more difficult conditions than even the United States faced in Iraq and Afghanistan, and we can talk about that, uh, why, why, why I say that, um, Israel has slashed by more than 75% uh, the kill ratio that had been the gold standard of the United States and its allies set in Iraq and Afghanistan. Even if you accept Hamas's bogus numbers, we, we uh, get numbers from the Gaza Health Ministry, but we've never met the minister. Um, and um, the Gaza Health Ministry, of course, doesn't differentiate between militants and civilians. It's released, I think it was in January, released uh, a long list of casualties, names, and dates of birth to rebut, um, I think, our government's suggestion that the numbers were made up. Uh, a lot of that uh, suspicion came from the fact that the numbers uh, are about the same every day, male and, and male to female, adult to child, uh, despite the fact that the Israeli military may or may not have been operating as intensely that day, whether it was raining or shining, doesn't matter. The Numbers are very similar every single day. So the United States and some Western 
governments that expressed, I think, suspicions about the numbers. Hamas released uh, a list of names in January. Well, over time, the Israeli military has gone into deeper and deeper into Gaza, into central Gaza, into the camps, and now, of course, into Khan Yunus. And in doing so, they've recovered uh, troves of data and information. And what do you know? Many of the folks who had been listed as civilian casualties, a huge percentage, actually, that had been listed in, as civilian casualties by the uh, Gaza Health Ministry were, in fact, killed. That was that part was true. But they were uh, card-carrying Hamas members, uh, paid salaries, given benefits, uh, uh, arranging meetings, uh, guarding hostages, that kind of thing. The other thing, of course, is that the numbers don't differentiate between people who are killed by uh, Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad rockets that misfire into Gaza versus people who are killed by Israeli fire. We know that this is a big problem in a couple of ways. One, we know it because of what happened at the Al Aliyah uh, hospital early on in the war. Um, uh, immediately after the uh, hospital uh, was attacked uh, by a rocket, uh, Hamas came out, the Gaza Health Ministry, the secret minister, came out and said 500 people were killed at the hospital because an Israeli bomb hit it. It's now understood, uh, it was understood actually by the end of that day, that Israel had nothing to do with it. In fact, no bomb hit the hospital at all. It was a Palestinian Islamic Jihad rocket that misfired and hit the parking lot of the hospital and then created a conflagration that killed nowhere near 500 people, probably more like 50 to 100 people. And that episode has been uh, has manifested itself over and over again in Gaza. But it's a great microcosm of what the Gaza Health Ministry does is that they inflate the numbers, 500 as opposed to 100. They inflate, uh, they, they distort what happened, claiming that uh, the hospital was bombed as opposed to a rocket hitting the parking lot. And of course, they lie about who's responsible, in that case, the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, and we don't even have to believe the wiretap conversation we've all heard by now of the two Palestinian Islamic Jihad terrorists admitting that it was their rocket that hit that hospital. We now have senior Palestinian Islamic Jihad members in Israeli custody who in videotaped confessions to the world last week admitted that uh, over 3,000 rockets from Palestinian Islamic Jihad and Hamas have misfired and fallen in Gaza, killing we don't know how many scores of innocent Palestinians. The point is, those numbers are totally distorted. But even if you believe those numbers, and this is the point, Israel's kill ratio is about one to one and a half or two, which according to John Spencer, one of the preeminent scholars on urban warfare anywhere in the world, that would be a gold standard on urban warfare that no army has ever been able to meet in modern times. And maybe that no army will ever be able to meet in urban warfare contexts in the 21st century. The last point I just want to make about that is a point about uh, what I said earlier, which is what Hamas is doing in order to purposefully get Israel to kill innocent Palestinian civilians. Every civilian who has died in Gaza was killed on purpose. That may be shocking for somebody like me to say. The terrorists who were killed were definitely killed on purpose by the Israeli military. The civilians who were killed were also killed on purpose, but they were killed by Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad. You don't have to believe me about it. Ghazi Hamad and other spokespersons for Hamas, including Khaled Mashal, have gone on TV over and over again since October 7th, and they have said things that are remarkable. In fact, sometimes I have the sense that Ghazi Ahmad might actually be a Mossad agent because what he says is too good to be true. He repeatedly says that he did not, that Hamas did not use any of the billions of dollars that they were given in aid to build bomb shelters for their civilians. And when he was asked on Lebanese TV, well, what are those hundreds of miles of terror tunnels that you built underground for? more sophisticated than any terror underground network the world has ever seen, more sophisticated, and I alluded to this earlier, than anything we as the United States or our allies encountered in Iraq and Afghanistan, even in the battle against ISIS 
in Mosul in 2012. Ghazi Hamad responds, well, those are for us. Those are for our fighters in order to survive the Israeli bombing that we knew would come. Well, what about the people of Gaza? Uh, the Lebanese TV reporter, who's very brave, by the way, uh, asked him, oh, no, no, no. We need those people to die, he said. We need martyrs. And how do they do that? Of course, they do it in simple ways, and they do it in more sophisticated ways. The simple way is, under the laws of war, there are three elements to the laws of armed conflict. Distinction, proportionality, and mitigation. We've already talked about proportionality. The law of distinction is simple. Soldiers who are combatants are supposed to wear a uniform. And what is the uniform? The uniform is a target that says, shoot me and not the other guy. I was a quarterback in football, and I used to wear a different kind of uniform. In practice, we, they put like a pink jersey on me so no one would touch me. A uniform in war is the opposite. It says, shoot me. But Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad fighters purposefully refuse to wear uniforms in so, order so to trick Israelis yeah. into killing the wrong people. And then they do it in more sophisticated ways too of course by embedding themselves within the civilian infrastructure and we saw countless pictures and videos of hamas fighters fighting out of hospitals mosques agricultural areas schools and we found we saw countless videos of israeli soldiers finding rockets machine guns all kinds of armaments and bulletproof vests again in schools in hospitals, and in the bedrooms of little boys and girls all across Gaza. I'll make one last point. There was some dispute, I guess, back in November about whether the Shifa and other hospitals were being commandeered by Hamas for military purposes. And we had to endure as common people in the United States who understand how to adduce evidence how to review evidence, because we do it all the time. When our kids are bad, we ask them questions, we adduce evidence, we figure out who did what and when. When we're lied to at work, when we're treated badly at the office, when we're in an accident on the road, we do this all the time. And yet we have to endure bizarre scenarios where, for example, CNN and other reporters would take us into the tunnels underneath the Shifa hospital, where CNN and other TV outlets would take us into the hospital itself, and we would see command and control centers, terror tunnels, unlike the world had ever seen before, machine guns in the maternity ward, bulletproof vests in MRI machines. I mean, that doesn't happen at Baptist Hospital in Miami, and yet we would have these TV anchors tell us, well, we're still not sure whether these hospitals are being commandeered by Hamas for military purposes. And then we had to endure the ridiculousness of actually watching October 7th hostages being paraded through the hallways of these hospitals. And still, these newspapers and TV stations would tell us, we're still not sure whether these hospitals are being commandeered for military purposes. Why not? Because Hamas denies it. Israel says that there's all this evidence. Yes, that's evidence. But Hamas denies it. Now, again, we don't have to believe what we saw in the videos. We don't have to believe what we found or what was found in the maternity wards, the emergency rooms, or the MRI machines, because Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad commanders, top-level commanders who have been found and arrested in Gaza, are now on video. These videos were released just last week, or maybe it was two weeks ago now, confessing on video that these hospitals, every single one of them, have been commandeered by Hamas for military purposes. So in the face of the most difficult uh, urban warfare terrain perhaps the world has ever known, the Israeli military is conducting perhaps the most humane, proportional war in an urban warfare environment the world has seen in modern times. And yet, of course, it's still Israel that's being calumnied in the press and on college campuses and in certain uh, Western diplomatic circles for having engaged in genocide, a preposterous claim that no, I think, reasonable uh, lawyer can believe.
Judge, and thank you so much for your, your thoughts and your comments. Um, we have a, a, a handful of questions that people have been raising in um, online and we will try to get to them. Uh, I don't think we'll get to all of them, but we certainly will try to address some of them. Uh, but before we do, uh, Professor Konarovic, um, maybe you can put into context for us um, what this, what we really mean by saying Hamas has hacked the international law of war. Uh, Judge Altman started to get into that a little bit by defining a few of these standards, but maybe you can put this into some greater context for us. Okay, absolutely. Um, the law of war, uh, first of all, it's a great honor uh, to speak after uh, the judge. Uh, it's very hard to uh, say anything that has not been said um, better and more forcefully. Uh, but let's zoom out. And the, the problem, the tendency when we speak about Israel and international law is we want to get straight to Israel. We want to get straight to Israel, um, which is typically if people in the newspapers are talking about international law, that's that's the occasion. Um, but we want to independently arrive at some understanding of what international law says um, before we think even about the cases to which it will apply. And that's normally what lawyers would do, right? They would figure out what the rule is and then apply it to the case rather than try to learn the rule and, uh, and the particular case at the same time. So there are a series of treaties that provide uh, the principal architecture for the uh, international law of war. Those are the four Geneva Conventions. Uh, there are some additional Geneva Conventions called the Additional Protocols, which Israel and the United States have not signed, but um, some of the norms in them are customary international law. But the relevant rules, uh, the relevant rules, I think um, there's no disagreement about. So let's briefly sketch what they are. The, the principal um, policy of international humanitarian law is to attempt to reduce, reduce, uh, which is not to say eliminate um, civilian suffering in wartime. Why do I say not eliminate? Uh, because there is no way to have a war without potential civilian suffering. Uh, and to say that you cannot have a war with civilian suffering is to make war illegal. Now, that sounds good, right? Don't we want to make war illegal? Well, um, yes and no. Uh, the yes is we want to make aggressive war illegal, which the UN Charter already does. Right? The UN Charter says you're not allowed to attack other countries as an instrument of foreign policy. Uh, at the same time, the UN Charter recognizes an inherent that right of self-defense. That is to say, a right that is not created by international law, that's a natural right. Every country has a right to defend itself, uh, using war also as a tactic. So to uh, ban, to say that you cannot have a war without civilian casualties um, is to ban self-defense. Right? is to ban self-defense. Uh, and then that would obviously only be good for um, uh, countries um, that are uh, aggressive. Um, there's many questions that I see in the comments about how international law functions and is different. It is very different and it doesn't function so well. So uh, we spend months in my uh, uh, first month in my introduction to international law class discussing that. Let's put that aside uh, for a second. Um, so the goal is to reduce civilian casualties, um, and the principal method for doing that is what's called the law of distinction. And the law of distinction requires each side to uh, separate their military personnel from their civilians, as uh, Judge Altman said, by wearing distinctive outfits. That Now, that we are used to soldiers in, uh, in um, developed armies. We're used to them. Uh, wearing uniforms, but it's really not obvious uh, as an element of strategy, right? If you're simply seeking maximum military benefit, uh, why would you wear shoot me signs on your back? You would rather just dress like everybody else and hop out occasionally and take shots at the guys who are silly enough to put big distinctive signs and emblems um, on their objectives. So, but, so why, why do we require that? Specifically, specifically 
to reduce the likelihood that actual civilians, those not taking any part in uh, hostilities, would be targeted. Uh, because obviously, if all the combatants are dressed as civilians, it's hard to know who is a civilian. So this is a price that the military will pay to put themselves in the line of fire rather than um, rather than uh, rather than uh, civilians. For example, just a very simple example: the uh, the tragic attack on the uh, aid workers. Right? What made that possible was that Hamas typically drives around in trucks that don't have like a big Hamas flag on it uh, and are not designed to look like military trucks. That makes any civilian truck, at least potentially, uh, a target. Okay, so the flip side of this is that uh, when uh, when a belligerent is about uh, considering an attack to attack a position of the enemy, they are only allowed to attack what is called military objectives. Military objectives. What is a military objective? A military objective is something that provides value and support to the enemy in their fight, which is obviously their soldiers, their combatants, and also their infrastructure, their supplies, their bases, their armories, um, uh, and their logistics facilities. So those can be targeted. Uh, they can be targeted even if it will, even if it is understood that this will result in some civilian casualties. Why? Because in the real world, uh, especially in urban warfare, um, it is very hard to have a sterile uh, military environment where there are no civilians around. And what international law says uh, quite clearly is that a strike is lawful even if it is known that it, in advance that it will kill uh, civilians, if the civilian harm is what's called proportionate to the military advantage. That is the rule of proportionality. The rule of proportionality is not that there needs to be some proportion between the casualties of both sides. That's absurd, because you win a war typically by inflicting disproportionate casualties uh, on the other side's military. Um, but rather... Uh, that you cannot, for uh, you, uh, uh, that the you cannot, for example, wipe out an entire building of civilians to kill maybe one sniper. But uh, the greater the military target and the greater the military advantage, the greater the permissible uh, civilian casualties. And all of that is based on the ex ante perspective of the of the attacker. That is to say, on the information and belief that they had beforehand. Um, so, for example, if you anticipated low civilian casualties, but there's a mistake, either you made a mistake or the other side was hiding civilians at this facility that you didn't know about, uh, that does not make the target, the attack, um, illegal ex post, right? The analysis is entirely ex ante based on the information available um, before the strike. Uh, which makes it, which makes judging the legality of strikes um, in real time on like CNN or social media completely absurd, because the information is not, uh, you know, the only way to do it is from the perspective of the attacking party, and you don't have that information. So how, in fact, are these things evaluated? Well, they're typically not evaluated by outside parties. These rules are more rules for countries to apply themselves to adopt themselves um, and processes for them to go through uh, themselves. Um, now, some. Now, what if the other side uh, breaks international law and locates its military targets in uh, next to a civilian, beside or in a civilian objective? So, international law is quite clear. The additional protocols actually quite clearly say that locating military facilities in civilian uh, places does not immunize the military facility. In other words, using human shields does not, in fact, prevent a strike on the uh, combatant forces using those human shields. And thus, the responsibility for uh, the casualties of those human shields lies on those who are impermissibly co-locating their military and um the military and uh, objectives and civilian sites. So 
Civilians are protected from being targeted directly. That is to say, you cannot target them just as civilians. But there is simply no international law uh, that bans civilian casualties because every single war ever fought by anyone would be illegal from start to end. Um, uh, and uh, that would, of course, have uh, many negative consequences um, in the world if you ever think war is justified. Um, if you think war is never justified and you're a pacifist, then the laws of war are not going to be uh, for you. Um, certain places, certain civilian sites have an even higher level of protection. Hospitals, for example, medical facilities, and ambulances have an even higher level of protection. But even that protection is lost if they're turned to military purposes. Um, one final rule uh, to mention, one final rule to mention, the um, international law does not ban what's called siege. Siege is surrounding an area, um, cutting it off and not allowing supplies to enter to prevent those supplies from uh, including food and water, from reinforcing your the enemy force. Um, the United States Defense Department Law of War Manual describes siege as a completely lawful and ordinary tool of uh, warfare. The United States does it all the time. Fallujah, uh, Mosul, Raqqa, uh, just in past uh, just in past in, in past years. Now there is some requirement for humanitarian relief for certain relief supplies to come in, very limited, aimed mostly at young children and pregnant or nursing women. But even that requirement um, is waived if there is a serious concern about, uh, um, about uh, those supplies being diverted, right? Being diverted from the civilians to whom they're uh, intended and to go to the combatant force. Okay, so those are the rules. Now let's step back. And what we see is, Hamas has done something extraordinary. They have reverse engineered the laws of war. They have figured out everything that is protected, civilians. So they built their entire, entire military infrastructure, the 300 miles of tunnels, under civilian sites, putting all of Gaza's civilians in the line of fire. They make their principal bases in hospitals. They use ambulances. And, of course, um, have been widely filmed uh, stealing uh, relief supplies, which thus invokes the diversion exception to humanitarian aid um, and makes uh, aid no longer uh, required. In other words, they have found everything that is protected and built their entire strategy around exploiting it. And I want to close by suggesting we've never really seen anything like this. Maybe ISIS, uh, but it's a very new thing. Uh, that is to say, take the baddest bad guys, right? The Nazis. Everybody, everybody's against the Nazis, or they think they would have been against them if they were around. Uh, I think we see that's less obvious these days. Um, the Nazis are responsible for some of the worst crimes known to man, greatest genocide known to man. But in terms of how they fought the war, they actually observed the law of war much of the time, maybe even most of the time. That is to say, they wore uniforms. They had regular armies that could e easily be targeted by the other side. Uh, they treated many prisoners of war, according to, uh, according to uh, international principles. They allowed visits by the International Committee for the Red Cross. Now, obviously, zero has been uh, Hamas has allowed. And they saw the um, casualties of their own civilians as um, something bad, something to be avoided. Uh, rather than something to be uh, to be maximized. In other words, when they wanted to, opportunistically, they would violate international law as much as, as they wanted. But they did not base their entire military strategy around it. Hamas's military strategy is synonymous with taking what international law um, protects and, um, and exploiting it. Now, why do they do this? Because it works for them in a political and diplomatic fashion. But by, a, but by rewarding them for this strategy, we ensure that not only will future bad actors violate the laws of war, they will actually invert them. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Um, some of them are based on uh, our participants uh, posing questions. But um, if, if the two of you can answer either one or both of them, and one of them, maybe first, Professor Kondorovich, you can address, what, what, what are the consequences if Hamas has failed to follow this international law of war, or if other countries fail to follow, if there are no consequences to it, what's the purpose? That's mm -hmm. one question. And the other question, which is somewhat related, is why, why don't we think Israel's proportionality and Israel's conduct of the war, the manners, the, the extent to which it goes to protect civilians, why can't we get that message out? And what is it just purely anti-Semitism or what is it? And maybe you can um, address one or both of those and, and judge if you could address it as well. Uh, sure. Let me take the first crack. Judge that okay? Sure. Go ahead. First question is, what do you do about Hamas violating the law of war? So the law of war does not have a clear um, enforcement mechanism. The principal enforcement mechanism for the law of war is um, self-help. That is to say, properly, uh, the best remedy for Hamas's violations of the law of war is... Um, Killing, killing a bunch of them, winning the war, capturing the rest, and prosecuting them in Israeli courts for war crimes violations, much as Nazi war criminals were prosecuted in the courts of allied countries. Um, there is no international constabulary, constabulary that will come and help. Now, there is the International Criminal Court. And the International Criminal Court is investigating charges against both Israel and uh, Hamas, but it is not much of a deterrent for Hamas. Why? The International Criminal Court also does not have its own police, so it depends on cooperation by member countries. Israel is not a member and rejects the jurisdiction of the ICC. Hamas believes that there's a state of Palestine which has joined the ICC, but in the history of the ICC, the ICC has never successfully uh, incarcerated or prosecuted uh, non-defeated uh, non de uh, leader of a non-free country. In other words, unless Israel beats Hamas, Hamas has nothing to fear from the ICC. And if Israel does beat Hamas, Hamas has a lot more to fear than the ICC. So the principal cost of proceedings in the ICC or IC ICJ are diplomatic. They're diplomatic. They are to um, harm the political standing of the of the targeted country. But the great thing Hamas has going for it is they have no political standing to be harmed. Everybody knows they're terrorists and either doesn't like it or doesn't care, but um, their political standing does not depend on being seen as some kind of uh, Western liberal regime. So um, they just don't care. And they also have a very powerful tool against uh, ICC proceedings. So if, if Israel, let's say, let's say um, somehow the ICC brought indictments and they were um, prosecuting an Israeli officer for allegedly uh, um, exceeding proportionality, who is going to come and testify that every single person in a particular hospital was a uh, Hamas was a was a Gazan civilian. Everybody who Hamas tells to come and testify like that. On the other hand, if Hamas is testify is being prosecuted, um, uh, if Hamas is being prosecuted, no one's going to come forward at all. In other words, uh, this is not a system that really uh, works well for Western democracies fighting uh, terrorist regimes. I think mm -hmm. that's quite. Clear. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Judge, maybe you can, can address the, the second part of the question relating to the, um, the messaging that um, is or isn't coming out of Israel as to proportionality, as to the steps that it takes to protect civilians. 
and and maybe in relation to that the the uproar around the world as to israelis actions in this conflict compared to for example easy example russia and its war with ukraine and the some of the early atrocities that we did hear about but are ongoing maybe you can comment a little bit on why there seems to be this difficulty of getting the message out uh, sure. I mean, there, there's, a, there's, to my mind, a clear bias, and uh, people have very entrenched positions uh, ex ante. That seems obvious if you're supporting Israel. Um, I think you're going to read certain news sources, and you're going to see John Spencer's information. Um, you're going to see his articles. You're going to see um, the videos. These videos, by the way, that I mentioned, where Israel is canceling strikes because of potential civilian uh, consequences around the periphery of the strike zone, those have been released uh, to public media outlets. As I understand it, nothing we saw was uh, classified or confidential. It's just a question of whether um, mainline and mainstream media outlets are willing to publish those videos. Uh, a lot of it, obviously, it seems to me, comes from sinister actors around the world. Uh, in After 1973, I think many of Israel's enemies uh, and America's enemies, who are conjoined, by the way, if, if this weekend taught us anything, it's that uh, Hamas is a Iranian proxy, and that Iran, who calls Israel only the little Satan, hates Israel principally because Israel is conjoined with the great Satan, which is us. Uh, we are tied to Israel in the mind of these nefarious actors mm -hmm. around the world, and they're all in league with one another. The Houthis have explicitly said, an Iranian terror-funded group in Yemen have explicitly said they will fire on and seize all ships and fire on all ships in um, in, uh, in the uh, streets, streets of Hormuz, except for Russian and Chinese ships, or Iranian ships, obviously. Uh, and so, so much of what we get, for example, on TikTok and other social media outlets um, come from uh, actors who have uh, anything but our best interests at heart. And uh, I saw an analysis uh, by a social media expert the other day that uh, to, the, to the, the point that I think something like 20 to 1, uh, the videos that you see on uh, TikTok, 20 to 1, uh, pro-Hamas versus pro-Israel. That level of distortion for a population, especially of young people who get their news principally from social media, I think is probably very hard to resist. And any of us who believes that we're able to resist the social media influx that is uh, that is coming our way and the algorithms they use in order to anger us, in order to get us to click more and to watch more, is just being naive uh, and hubristic about your power to resist those algorithms. I, for myself, I don't watch social media or have any social media um, at all. So, how do we get the message out? Uh, I think we have to be, we have to do things like this all around the country and the world. I've been traveling all over the country since. October 7th. So as Professor Kantorovich um, lecturing on Israeli history and the history of the Jewish people. I mean, the claim that Jews are colonists in the land of Israel is absurd on its face. Jews are the indigenous people of the land. If you look back 3,000 years ago and move to today, there's only one people on earth that continues to live on the same land, practice the same religion, and speak the same language that they did 3,000 years ago. And that's the Jewish people who land in Israel. There can be no more indigenous group of people who are the governing coalition in their particular in, uh, country. And yet it's Jews who are called uh, it, it, colonists in the land of Israel. Same with the illegitimacy of the state of Israel. We hear all the time that it was this weird aberrational thing that was drawn on a map by British colonists in 1948. I mean, that's just preposterous. It was voted on by the representatives of the combined nations of the world, 33 to 13 in, two, in 1947, and 37 to 12, a second vote. There was a motion for reconsideration. None of us like motions for reconsideration, and Israel doesn't either. But they won the motion for reconsideration in 1949. I think it was 37 to 12. And since then, and until today, we've had, I think, a sinister campaign by people who, especially after 1973, realized, you know what, we're not going to defeat Israel militarily. Iran, I think, certainly learned that lesson this weekend. 
We're not going to defeat Israel militarily. And so they've started a 50-year plan to try to infiltrate our drive a wedge between the United States and Israel, between Israel and its closest allies. And that wedge has come to fruition, sadly, on college campuses and in Western media outlets. The other thing I'll say is, is for example, you just saw someone ask a question on this chat. Uh, the way people distort what folks are saying, even on this chat, uh, I think is uh, disturbing. Someone said, how do you trust that the Israeli numbers aren't just totally made up? I think I was clear that none of the numbers that I was giving were Israeli numbers. The data that I was giving came either from John Spencer, an American non-Israeli war scholar at West Point, or from Hamas itself, uh, not from the Israeli government. We frankly got no numbers so far as I can recall from Israeli sources. And um, and so I think it's important to bring people to Israel. That's the last point I want to make. Um, you know, we brought 15, 14 judges to Israel. Um, if you're a scientist, I would bring 15 scientists to Israel. If you're a doctor, I'd bring 15 doctors to Israel. If you're a lawyer, bring 15 lawyers to Israel, because seeing is believing. The claim that Israel is purposefully engaging in genocide, that the people of Israel have created an apartheid state, that there's something colonialist about what's going on in Israel, when 20% of the population are Arab Muslims who prefer to live in the state of Israel than they would to live in any other Arab state, according to the most recent polls that we've seen on that subject, belie all of the popular misconceptions that are spread all over social media and on college campuses. So to my mind, seeing is believing. Bring organized trips, take people to Israel, and, and look at more than just your TikTok feed. I, I feel compelled to at least add one comment to, to yours, uh, Judge Altman, and uh, regarding the establishment of the state of Israel. And one of the reasons why the borders have been set the way they were in 1948 is because Jewish National Fund over the past hundred years has been legitimately purchasing parcels of land, voluntarily purchasing from the from Arabs who owned the land. Um, and over that period of time, much of that border was because that land had been purchased. Um, I'll say so one other thing on that point, which is this, the double standard that that uh, is just all too familiar and, and I think evinces a clear bias. We, we talk about the proportionality in, under the laws of war. Where were all the protesters when uh, Russia and Syria were killing hundreds of thousands of innocent people in Syria? Where were all the protesters? when the Jordanians and Lebanese were killing tens of thousands of Palestinian civilians in refugee camps? Where were all the protesters uh, when uh, hundreds of thousands of people were killed in Congo and in Darfur? It, it's just a protest movement that exists for one purpose, and that is to protest the existence and legitimacy of the one Jewish state in the world. And as to borders, where are all the protesters suggesting that uh, Pakistan is illegitimate over the borders it governs. It was also created in 47, 48 by being drawn as lines on a map by British colonists. What about the protesters who claiming the illegitimacy of the borders of Iraq and Jordan and Lebanon and Syria, all countries just drawn as lines on a map by British and French colonists in the aftermath of World War I? There, there are no such protesters. There are no such claims. Again, there is a clear bias I think on Western campuses and in Western media outlets, not everywhere, in certain circles, um, uh, against the one Jewish state in the world. Well, I, I am mindful of everyone's time, and we're we're running close to one o'clock. So I do want to thank you, uh, Judge Altman. Thank you, Professor Kantorovich, for your thoughts and your insights. Um, I hope uh, everyone on this um, Zoom call. Um, appreciates um, the perspective that you shared with us. It's been a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Professor. And thank you very much, uh, Steve, for having us. Obviously, I should just say, nothing I said, I said as a judge, I said it as an American citizen. We went in our private individual capacities to Israel um, and uh, maybe with someone who has a little bit of legal training. Professor, you're on mute. Thank you, everyone, and keep up the good work. All right. Take care, folks. I want to thank everyone for joining us today.
I especially want to thank our guest speakers, the Honorable Roy Altman and Professor Eugene Kontorovich for their amazing expertise and insights on this important topic. We are so grateful for all the work you're doing. All attorneys attending our CLE program today will receive an email tomorrow with a link to your CLE attendance certificate. Thank you.